Michael, how are you? Hi, Shafi, I'm doing well, how are you? That's wonderful. So I'm extremely excited actually to interview you because you are a giant. I'm excited to be interviewed by you. So we have a mutual <laughs> admiration here. We have a mutual excitement. First of all, uh, I'm gonna ask you to uh, introduce yourself a little bit. Sure. Yes. Um, uh, you know, as, as uh, you've already alluded to, I'm interested nowadays, particularly economics meets computer science meets statistics. So I think of it as a kind of a triad. Let me just say, I came, I've, I've been sort of in every academic discipline you can imagine. Uh, when I was an undergrad, I did philosophy and French language and literature. Then I did some psychology and um, I ended up in the neuroscience department at, uh, at MIT. And uh, I studied control theory as a grad student. And since I've been at Berkeley, it's been computer science, statistics, and now more and more economics. Um, and let me just say a little, a couple of words about that last kind of thing. It, it really is driven by being in the outside world a lot too. So I've spent time at Amazon, I've spent time at Alibaba, and watching people problem solving in the modern world, it's uh, often involving networks and flows of data and human values and decisions and uncertainty. So whenever you really see people around a table solving those kind of problems, like building a commerce system or a you know, transportation system or whatever, or logistics system, it's almost always case you have some computer scientists, you have some statisticians, you have some economists. And so I was kind of really struck by that, that, you know, academically, we didn't really have all those disciplines in the same room at the same time. And I noticed that you had pairwise interaction. So really computer science meets statistics, that's machine learning. You know, computer science meets economics, that's algorithmic game theory. And statistics meets economics, that's, uh, that's econometrics. And all three of those pairwise connections are very healthy. They've been around for quite a while now, but they don't really see the third leg of the uh, of the triad. So, you know, econometricians, they didn't have a lot of computer science. Algorithmic game theorists, not a lot of statistics. And uh, machine learning people, not a lot of economics. This is a little bit of an exaggeration, but uh, long story short, both for outside of academic reasons and academic reasons, um, I kind of think of myself in the middle of that triad. So in fact, I've seen uh, you put this equation on the board, which is AI is equal to data plus algorithms plus markets. And yeah. I think that your description a second ago really illustrates that. So data is one of the big motivators for this shift, I guess, that we've been seeing, or at least the hype that we've been seeing in the last uh, five, 10 years. And the scale is larger than anything that we've witnessed before. And then uh, algorithms, obviously we've been working them for many years. A, you know, I come from theoretical computer science, you come from more of the statistics and um, I guess AI or machine learning, what they, whatever they call it these days. This is actually jumps to a question that I was gonna ask later. You know, as a theoretical computer scientist, proving, you know, performance, proving correctness of algorithms is essentially what we have to do. Uh, to, uh, that's sort of the definition of our business. I think the same is true about statistics, but these days, a lot of the algorithms that are being developed, they just seem to work according to some definition. And I wondered if you can uh, comment on that. Although I think of this as kind of a big emerging engineering field akin to electrical engineering 100 years ago or chemical engineering 50 years ago. So it's not kind of one thing. It's going to eventually distill some principles that are going to have inferential and computational and, and incentives all kind of bundled together. I'm not sure we know what those principles are and we don't really know how to build the system. So people try, just like they tried you know, 50 years ago to, to build chemical factories or that people would electrify a city. And it would kind of work, you know, it changed the world, right? But it wasn't principled or rigorous and it did explode and blow up and make messes at times. Um, and I think we're in an era where we're seeing lots of messes and lots of lack of understanding and um, people are seeing around the edge, oh, it didn't really quite work. Um, particularly the neural net stuff on certain class of problems where you have huge amounts of data, like, you know, language. So, you know, the, there's language everywhere. Uh, you can grab all of that and you can make a system that kind of works for a little while. Uh, it's not really an intelligent system. It has, it, you know, David Donahoe once called it recycled intelligence. It's taking human intelligence, which has been put on the web and ref reflecting him. It's not really human intelligence. It's something that reflects, you know, it's the output of human intelligence. And you're recycling that uh, to kind of make it seem like you're intelligent. And so it works, you know, in somewhat narrow situations, increasingly broad, but still it's always going to be a little narrow and it's going to fail in lots of edge cases. And it's also going to fail as things change. 
Um, you know, as a year goes by, I know of no machine learning system that will be remotely healthy. <laughs> it'll it'll be, be you know out of distribution. It'll it'll be not robust. It'll be a mess. You know, so in that sense, it's not very intelligent at all. It's kind of just limited in scope and scale. It's kind of like a you know very narrow intelligence. So if you look around and think about what other systems out there are intelligent, or you know, and broadly speaking, you know, not just humans, right, and not just other animals. You know, but an economy is an intelligent entity. It works for decades, if, if not centuries. It adjusts, at, at, you know, it works at small scale, large scale. It, it's robust. You know, the weather changes, it still kind of works. And, you know, as technology changes, it incorporates that. I mean, these, they aren't perfect economies. They have markets. They have uh, all kinds of problems. So that just means it's a powerful, you know, engineering kind of tool to be thinking about. Um, so that equation you alluded to earlier was kind of an attempt to say, look, intelligence is not just human intelligence. Mimicking that. It's not even clear what useful kind of you know productivity goal that's going to change in the real world, uh, but it's going to it's it's definitely going to create non-robust you know limited systems, and that's what we're seeing right now. So just adding the kind of perspective, oh, intelligence. It's it's also about the overall market and the uh, interactions at that level. Uh, that entity gives rise to intelligence, and and their algorithms obviously at that level, and they work, you know, on time scales that are kind of human scale. Um, you know, markets adjust over human scale. So um, analyzing and building. You know, and thinking about the kind of core principles there uh, seems to me that kind of the, the the way forward. So it's interesting because when you uh, again, if I come back to a po point of view of a, of a cryptographer, actually, especially a sort of a cryptographer who cares about you know giving some sort of guarantees in the form of some sort of mathematical reduction, uh, you always think about an adversary. So yeah. there's no adversary. There's no really need in cryptography. And uh, the adversaries can be varied. So there's also adversarial situations in, I assume, in statistics, sort of obviously sure. the wrong samples, and maybe yeah. someone fed you the wrong samples. And maybe yeah. the, um, the model of the adversary could be restricted, could be general. But in, I guess, in um, data-driven algorithms or AI, uh, you have adversaries lurking everywhere in the training data, in, uh, the, in, the, in, the, in the robustness. Yeah. In verifying yeah, sure. that the, if you delegate the algorithms to someone else who says that they actually trained it cor uh, correctly, maybe they put in back doors. It seems to be so, um, it's all over the place. We could talk our entire time about that, really. So I would broaden the word adversary to include things like competitors or, you know, uh, suspicious neighbors or whatever, you know. So people who could get some value out of each other if they were to trade and they would interact, but aren't entirely trusting. And so one way to handle things like that is to set up incentives where it's just not in your interest to, to cheat or to steal or lie or whatever. Um, others are that you have kind of iterative systems where we, we develop trust over time. And, um, and, you know, and so if I go into a market in Tel Aviv, I assume that there's some adversaries there. There's people who would like to you know, separate me from my money, but I still get a lot of value out of going there. And it's a lot of fun. And, and that's how humans are. We kind of learn to find ways to interact over time. And and partly we build up reputation and partly we, we, we don't mind a little bit of loss from time to time. We take on some risk. Uh, it's adventuresome and so on and so forth. That's how humans are. Um, you know, so thinking about it in this broader sense of um, there's always going to be around uh, people. If the system is bad, I just don't want to be involved in it. If, if people are incentivized to cheat and line steal, I should try to stay away from it altogether. If the incentives have been set up good, well by a good algorithmic person and there's proofs and all that, that's reassuring. I'm going to go into that. But even there, I'm going to have my antenna up. Um, and um, so, you know, in statistics, yes, we have robust methods. There's robust control. There's many max principles all over the place. And those give guidance to the design of systems, all right? But then the actual system gets deployed and you hope that kind of online it exhibits natural robustness. Um, and I do think that as computer scientists and statisticians, we've been a little bit too enamored of our equations and our, you know, guarantees and our theory that has nothing to do with humans. And, you know, behavioral economists and psychologists sort of tell you, well, and even HCI people will tell you that, you know, the, the last mile is to actually have humans interacting. And they're treating a human as just a potential adversary is, is, is kind of missing economic value. There's someone who can partially be trusted and partly not. And so quantifying that and bringing that into the equations, um, I think, is kind of a scientifically exciting thing to do. That is true. Although in your example about you buying something at Tel Aviv and maybe bargaining for price, you and the seller are not that different. When I think about what's happening today in terms of who's holding the data, these are not really individuals, but these yeah. big companies. 
and they can be using their data in any way they like to make more money. And maybe sometimes they, their way of thinking about it is restricted to sort of the now, the right now. And if they're going to yeah. give me content that I've liked in the past, then probably I'm going to like it in right now. And then they, you know, there's the whole discussion about polarization and all that. Sure. So the adversaries here are not, don't be, be symmetrical. There's some adversaries who are much more powerful than I am. Um, there are, but I think we kind of are looking at sort of 20 years in, you know, uh, networks made, you know, Facebook possible and made, you know, uh, commerce possible. And uh, it's really kind of a mess right now uh, you know, there's, there's anonymity, there's, um, you know, incentives to do bad things. Um, uh, there's uh, scams of all kinds. And, um, and I don't, I don't believe that we'll be in that same place in 20 years. And I don't think it'll just be like hardening the silos. I think it'll be, oh, you can't have pure anonymity. There's a little bit of recourse, you know, there's an identity, there's, um, you know, just like banks, you know, there was the, it was the wild west literally at some point, and then it got more and more systematized where we all trust that we can go into an ATM machine and so on. Um, we uh, will take time and that's gonna be so partly just social contracts and lawyers will have to be involved in social scientists and all um but we're we're not there and i don't think we perceive uh that you know so i think we got there i mean we could get into the history but you know it's partly just because everything had to be free and open and and you know it was a libertarian ideal and that worked for a while it's not working now and, and so um so what do you do you know you have that this requires kind of uh serious people to come into the room and 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 representative people not just a small cabal it's got to be everybody and build systems that, we, that you um, do have kind of transparency or record, you know, recourse. It's like in every, I mean, if I go to the television market, I have a little bit of recourse. I can yell and scream or, you know, that person, I can tell everybody how bad they are. And um, that's how humans have interacted for centuries. And, and somehow we got stuck in this world that um, people can be awful to each other anonymously and people can are incentivized to lie and cheat and steal. Um, you know, in Europe, the, the 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 laws are now you know getting to be very strong, and some of them unrealistic. So, but they are pushing back on you. You have to be transparent. You have to be uh, you know give recourse. You have to make it possible for people to know what's going on. If data are used to make a loan decision, it has to be you have to be clear on how that was done. And so, partly it's going to be some regulation, but also it's just going to be the business model. If you're a company that doesn't do any of that, I think that you're going to lose out. And um, and, you know, and frankly, uh, you know, not to be too provocative, but, you know, Facebook has had a lot of trouble, the core Facebook instrument, because it's not, people don't like it. They don't like to be in that world where their data is exploited. Even Instagram I'm seeing is now you're having troubles, you know, then TikTok emerges and all. There is a shift in the business model uh, to give, to empower people. And um, once people realize that they can be empowered, uh, they're going to flock to the new thing that allows them to be empowered. That's again, somehow market forces and um, people aren't going to tolerate us to stay where we are right now. Um, so it'll take time. It'll take all kinds of, uh, you know, it's, it's a really one of the more complicated efforts I think humans have ever engaged in. Uh, it's a technology that is all about math and equations and electrons and human values and it's at planetary scale and highly interactive. So it's like there's nothing ever been like it before. So indeed, uh, you were talking about uh, the privacy of your data held by Facebook. Or, uh, so you know that the business of duality, who you are on our science uh, advisory yeah. board, uh, is privacy. And uh, yeah. usually we divide it into sort of three categories. We talk about privacy of people's data in, in training or in prediction. We talk about collaborations which I think uh, goes to your incentive uh, issue. That is mm -hmm. how to incentivize collaborations, how to, people, how to make people realize, uh, which I believe truly that if they are gonna collaborate, they will get more out of their data. Mm -hmm. and, but, and yet, because they're not completely trusting, we are offering them some mechanisms to protect their data while they are collaborating. And then I guess the third thing is privacy of the models. So, so people might think of their models as uh, intellectual property because they've figured out something based on looking at data, based on their mathematical sophistication, and now they want to uh, hold on to it. So these are sort of the three uh, privacy problems. Any thoughts about which ones are sort of more, more important, more interesting? Uh, they're all they're great i mean that's a great summary um you know part of it it's it's um you know privacy sounds like you're like you're you're depriving of something right it's it's kind of uh you know another way to think about it is that i want to have some data ownership and you know people have talked about this quite a bit of course that um you know i possess something as an individual that some that some company wants but also just you know coalitions of us might possess something and um 
Um, and if I can can achieve a little bit of ownership over it and, and then sell it and make make you know I can I can make make money off of it. And so um, you know you're seeing more and more of that. I mean, think about people that put up YouTube videos and put up you know music and all that. You know, in some sense, that's their data. Um, and right now they're kind of deprived of an income from that. I mean, they, they get a little bit of small change back, you know, from, uh, you know, Spotify or, or whatever. Um, but it really is something they should be able to have more ownership rights over that the kind of the way it's distributed and all that it does flow back to them. And so that requires, just like the banking industry, it requires kind of serious auditing capabilities and serious provenance capabilities and serious crypto and serious attention to the ownership, you know, whose data is that, where should the value flow? And um, and then seriously, you know, if the value starts to accumulate, worrying about how that can get out of control and, and regulating it and all that. And so there's kind of an, you know, economy meets comp computer science meets uh, human social science that's kind of, again, yet to emerge. And uh, the, the, the underpinnings of it, partly privacy is one of the first things that we've seen that kind of we can put a name to and say, can you guarantee me privacy under a certain kind of transactional system? And that allows us as math people to kind of start to say how to do that and then to make a commodity out of that and to start to build from there. And I think that will kind of accumulate and those three kinds you alluded to will allow, oh, someone can have a little business model based on their data. Um, oh, I can bring together a consortium where they all get more value out of putting their data together than they would have otherwise. You know, oh, uh, that could be done either in a very highly competitive situation where natural competitors still share things like about, you know, um, uh, attacks or fraud models, or instead, Maybe like hospitals want to share data. They're not competitive, but they you know have some regulatory issues to overcome. Um, and so the, the 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 use cases are huge for all three of the things you've talked about. And again, we don't really have that right now, and we're going to have it in twenty years. And so it's going to really be it's it's fantastically important and exciting. It will liberate. Um, it'll create jobs at the end of the day. It'll liberate kind of human pot potential to um, to trade and to to uh, have individual control. So it won't be just the companies possess all the data and they give drab, drips and drabs to people. There will be a more of a symmetric relationship and there'll be more coalitions emerging and brokerages and um, and all of that. Um, that's, that's clearly what's gonna happen. And um, we're just at the beginning. So I, I couldn't obviously agree with you more. And I also wanted to say that um, you were emphasizing uh, previously that there has to be some transparency in how we interact with each other. One of the things that we say in the first lecture and cryptography course is that the algorithm is well known. It's just the key, okay, that is hidden. And it's very important to sort of argue about correctness of the system or privacy or security of the system under that model. So there's nothing hidden about how it works. It's just, that right. let's say a key which is, separates you from me because I know one key, you know another and so, and, and so forth. You know, so it's an interesting question of whether, you know, ML systems could be completely transparent and yet work properly. Yeah. yeah, no, I think we're not we're not entirely clear on that. I mean, you could imagine like a banking situation that you're doing, you know, you're looking at loans and um, people come in and there's a feature vector describing them and it goes into a model and outcomes prediction. Uh, some aspect of that has got to be transparent. It just cannot be that humans will tolerate a black box uh, doing things there. So it could be that um, you, you have to use a certain kind of family models, a logistic regression or you know, something where the influence functions are bounded or, you know, there, there has got to be some kind of a constraint that, and then, you know, individual humans won't necessarily understand all of that kind of language, but there will be brokers, there'll be experts that'll kind of help you interpret, just like there is in the finance world, you know, what you can expect, what recourse you might have, um, you know, so if you, um, if you, if you, if they ask you a few questions about yourself and you kind of need to know which ones are the important ones or which ones that you could change if you got like a bad result, it's not enough to just know you got a bad result. Um, it's, you know, one of them says, well, go get more, be more credit worthy or, you know, or exercise more or whatever. Uh, humans will want to have a, a recourse, not just a result. And so I think that that's part of the, the machine learning architecture. Um, you know, so around the machine learning system, won't necessarily be in around it. There'll be the kind of, you know, the protocols and the uh, ability to query certain aspects of it and then limitations on that and so on. That, again, we're still kind of just glimmer. There's, we have glimmers of. So, in fact, uh, some sort of verification or auditing in addition to developing yeah. an algorithm. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the next thing I want to ask was about, I know that you've been interested in all kinds of ethical AI issues. Maybe this is still the case, or maybe this was prior, you're interested in markets. I know that you have had many interests in uh, at least 
speaking for myself, you know, it's sort of like you go into an area and then you come out and you go again. Um, but in terms yeah. of uh, the whole unintended consequences and ethics, mm. how do you wrap your head around that? Mm. I mean, I yeah, I mean, I think our conversation has kind of, in some sense, been about that, really, because uh, I don't think the ethics word just should stand off by its side, you know, right. on the side. Uh, that if I build a bad system and I didn't vet it mathematically and I didn't give guarantees, then I'm that's an ethical lapse. It's a business lapse too, and all that, but it's also ethical, unethical. Um, if yeah. I th don't think through the fairness properties of my system. Um, you know, meaning that it really should serve the long tail. Maybe there's clusters of people. Every cluster should get served, you know, in the right way. It should be all transparent. And and um, and so those are ethical things that uh, should go into thinking about systems. You know, so I, it becomes so vast. And again, I don't think it's just a technical problem. I think that, you know, social scientists and lawyers and, uh, and you know, humanities, you know, all of, all humans should be able to be involved. And, 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 um, and we'll, we'll have to kind of teach people to speak the language that's necessary so them they can understand the consequences of what's happening and, and all that. That's part of the ethics. Um, rolling out systems without any of the above, that's unethical. Um, and, and, you know, so it's bad business practice, too. And so if you can hopefully tie that together, that bad business practice goes together with unethical, that's the ideal. Um, it's not going to always happen. Um, so, you know, I just I think it's it's um, uh, to be an ethical scientist is to be a good scientist, to be a good engineer. Uh, it's also to be an inclusive one. It's also to talk to lots of people. And, um, um, you know, so, uh, yeah, the ethics word is is absolutely key. But I think, again, building a a um, a bad drug that, you know, hurts people is unethical. Building a, you know, chemical factory that explodes is unethical and so on. So in some sense, it's uh, it's not that new. I just think the power and the, the, the omnipresence of it in, in people's lives, you know, factories could be out in the field and they could maybe kill people if, you know, they're living nearby, but, uh, or they, you know, uh, uh, pollute the environment. But now it's omnipresent in our lives. And so the ethical consequences are higher, but um, uh, they're not completely new. I want to refer to something, you've used the word trust before in several settings. Uh, so even if you kind of restrict yourself to crypto, okay, we talk uh, in for multi-party computation where there's several parties that are working together, or whether yeah. it's uh, they're using fully homomorphic encryption or other protocols, there is different trust models. One is to trust the fact that some mathematicians are saying that certain problem in mathematics is hard, you know, like RSA or uh, computing some yeah. short vector in a lattice. So that's in some sense putting a trust in what we know and what we believe to be true in mathematics. And then another kind of trust is that we um, we say we don't we sort of split information across different servers and we trust that they don't collaborate in order to attack us or federated learning. You know, I guess in some sense there is a there is a Google or there is an Apple and they arrange subsets of people in groups uh, sort of and they do these protocols and we trust them uh, these subsets to not kind of uh, act. Uh, to act the way that we expect, and we trust Google to, uh, or Apple to assign those subsets. I mean, trust, I don't, I don't ever remember from my career, uh, which has also spanned, unfortunately, a few decades at this point, so much talk about trust as part of doing math. What is the right trust model? Does it really make sense? And when, uh, you know, some companies say that, trust us, we're doing it, uh, I find myself doubting it you know maybe that's part yep. of the course yeah yeah i doubt it too and i think a lot of people doubt it um uh so i again i don't think there's secrets to some of this i mean the word you used the word audit earlier um part of it is don't just trust a priori or trust because of some reputation or because they have a lot of money um you know trust because you or someone else can can audit so there is a you know if you really have a lot of time on your hands you could go in and you could dig and get all the way to the end that alone uh, gives me some reassurance that they're not going to try to cheat too much because they could really pay for it if somebody really wants to go in and look. Um, you know, right now, I think we're in a situation where there's not the ability to audit very much at all. You know, you're really, really walled off from, from that. And, you know, only by like Freedom of Information Act because ever and years later, does someone find out something that can't be the case anymore it has got to be much, 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 much more auditable. There's got to be kind of organizations whose job is to audit. Um, and uh, you then trust maybe that organization because over the years they build up a reputation for doing it well. You know, why do I trust anything out there? I mean, right now it's getting to be hard, right? But uh, I still do trust, you know, people who I have reason to trust. Um, and I trust they did something and therefore I don't have to do it. 
Yeah. Right. But if it's not, if it's, it's not even possible to do that something, then I can't, that, that, that level of trust is broken. Yeah. Um, so again, I think these are, these are the vast topics and we, we just have a little kind of small role to play in helping make this possible. And, and um, I think it really is important as computer science, we talk the language and talk it as broadly as possible. You know, that trust involves uh, many different kinds of things. Absolutely, as you point out. And uh, that welcomes in other people who say, well, that aspect of it, I can, you know, I'm a behavioral economist or I'm a lawyer. I, that part I can resonate to, like the word recourse. That's one that I think I've learned from hearing, you know, legal type people speaking. Um, and so adopting some of their dialogue and some of their mechanisms and putting that into systems and all that. Um, you know, so um, I, I do think that the big companies are still kind of in a mess, but I mean, some of them, I think, have a business model that's not just based on advertising. And overall, I think that a little more healthy. Very few. You know, so, so, yeah, I mean, I, you know, um, I think the companies that do e-commerce are a little bit better placed because they send packages around people, you know, packages arrive. And, and so, for example, nowadays it's possible to order something online. And if you don't like it, you send it back, right? That's a form of recourse that they just sort of did the calculation. They realized that, yeah, there's going to be people cheating on us, um, but it's not going to, we, we can manage. And just like credit card, you know, risk, there's a little bit there and we can manage. And so that built up a whole trust, you know, that people, you know, of all kinds were willing to kind of now buy things online. And that opened up a whole set of, you know, uh, economic value, you know, and then aspects of it have, you know, further been exploited. But I think that already is kind of an example of, um, of, a, of a, you know, absolutely about trust. If I did, you know, um, why should I put my credit card number into a computer ever? Well, because I trust that I'll get some value out of it. And I will have some recourse if I don't like something. Um, you know, I, was thinking I don't that, think they did that just because they're good people. I really think they did that because they realized that was a way better business model than, um, than not doing it that way. So I was thinking that uh, often when you talk, at least people that are um, not experts in the field, and you talk about uh, machine learning, you talk about prediction systems. With everything we've been talking about, auditing and trusting or not trusting, that to, in the same extent, and maybe more so, you could think of uh, drawing a signal and reverse engineering sort of what's really happening. So using using machine learning or data dri driven uh, to uh, reverse decision to actually enforce behavior because otherwise you can be detected. Uh, I don't know if there's any or much use of that, but it seems to me that using it, or for example, to look at data and find biases rather than necessarily for using that data to you know, to, to do predictions in the future. So it, it seems like a great tool. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree with you there. And I, I think you're actually kind of getting what an econometrician does a lot. And again, that's kind of the third, you know, one of the legs of our, of our triangle there. Um, so uh, think about- Suppose you're looking at a, you're the, you know, a search engine and you, um, you look at the number of misspellings of words. Okay, so that seems like a dumb thing. There shouldn't be ever any misspelled words and you know, Google should correct the misspellings, which they do, it's all part of that. All right, but what if you've just um, you know, instituted a new educational you know, thing for teaching kids how to spell in some little, you know, in some little, in some county in New Jersey, right? And the, uh, the next county didn't do that. And now what if you look at the kind of streaming of the search engine in those two counties and count the number of misspellings, right? That's, that's a fantastic kind of what's called a natural experiment. It's a way to evaluate, you know, the, so the data now is, you know, search queries. And you would have thought that would have been used for now casting and predicting the stock market, whatever. Sure, you can do it that way. You can also use it for a whole different purpose that it wasn't actually ever intended for, but is a really interesting way to assay what's happening. And uh, that's what econometricians kind of do. They look around for like, you, you know, cool ways to infer things that you wouldn't have been able to infer otherwise. Um, and yeah. thinking about things that are, you know, natural experiments. Uh, the machine learning world has been very much focused only on prediction and kind of what's observational. You just look at the data, you grab it, and you make predictions. And that's known to have not just biases, but it... Um, uh, it's not causal inference. Um, it doesn't balance things. Uh, there's feedback loops inside of it. I know you've been working on this too, and I want to talk with you more about what you're doing. Um, you know, the feedback loops inside of machine learning, data processing, and gathering systems are a key part of the issue. And and so it definitely just the the, the grab a data set, make predictions on it. Um, uh, you know, is is a very very limited perspective on what machine learning is. Yeah, to me, uh, the ability to get benchmarks or to test out, as you say, experiments or to find signal is a big part of the future. 
fact, I think even in our in duality, the ability to get up to get benchmarks from by collaborations without revealing your data, then to test out whether how well you're doing, how well your competitors are doing, are you above, are you below, it, but more refined than just averages, you know, and a lot of statistical parameters. Yeah. Yeah. is definitely something you can, yeah. you can so I'm, I, maybe this is an area we you and i overlap in but i've been working on contract theory recently which is uh it's an area in economics mm -hmm. uh that's kind of the parallel to auctions you know you have in the economics you have the field of mechanism design right. how do i build kind of games that give you know desirable outcomes and one branch of that is auctions and there's been huge work as you know you know with ad, ad auctions and all the other branch though is contract theory and we all know about it all the time why are there different prices for seats on the airplane? Why don't they just set one price and it would be simple and all that? Well, if they set it too low, the people who are totally willing to pay more would just pay the lower price and they lost a lot of income. If they set it too high, the people who are you know, not able to pay that price wouldn't and the plane would be half full. So you'd think, well, why not just go ask a person, what's the price you're willing to pay? And of course, you know, from auction theory or wherever else, you know that's not that's a dumb thing to do. Uh, and so auctions kind of try to assay that price with second prices and all that. Contract theory does it in a different way. It says, okay, I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna try to figure out what you want, but I'm gonna give you some options. I'm gonna set up a little menu of contracts. So, um, you know, if you want to have a little bit bigger seat and you want a little, you know, a little silly glass of red wine and a little bit of stature, then you'll pay a thousand dollars more and it's called business class. And I don't have to ask you well, if you're like ready for this. I just have to make it as an option. And someone, and then another option is economy class where you don't have the silly little glass of wine and you pay a much lower fare. And now people can opt, they can decide. And now by doing that, they've revealed a little bit of information about themselves, but not that much, right? I mean, I buy, I might buy an economy class fare just because for whatever reason, I want to sit back with my friends or whatever. Um, back in the old days, people used to smoke on airplanes. And I used to find the people in the smoking section much more fun to talk to than the non-smoking. So I'd always go to the smoking section. Um, so people have all kinds of reasons for doing what they're doing, but contract theory is the mathematical theory of taking asymmetric information situations where somebody knows something, but they're not willing to reveal it, but they want to play the, you know, they want to engage and they don't want to just reveal. Uh, whereas auction theory is a little bit more about, let's find a way to get you to reveal what you, what you, you know, your value for something. Um, and so anyway, bringing contract theory together with machine learning, it's a whole new area that's emerging. We have now have a paper on this. And um, I think that's kind of part of the story. You don't just assume all the data is available or the people are gonna, you know, you're gonna ask them to reveal things. Uh, you set up you know, options where you know, the overall, anyway, what's the overall, overall objective here? Uh, it, it's not to reveal more information. It's not, it, the overall objective is social welfare, that everybody, the sum of the happiness is, is maximized. And no, I, love, I don't know if you noticed, but in the, in, the, in the beginning of your answer, this last answer, you chose to say the, pl the plane is half full rather than half empty. And <laughs> because I was expecting you to say, as a, as a consequence of where you were going, that the plane is half empty. So you are um, a yeah. half full kind of guy. So yeah, exactly. with everything else, no matter what's going on, you are an optimist that science marches, marches That's forward. Right. That's so right. What's something that really excites you that you believe is going to happen next? Yeah, yeah I get I have had that question in other interviews. And I'm sure you've had it, too. Um, and I don't have a good answer to it. I, I tend to resist it. I, I tend to be a half full kind of guy. I just I guess I don't if human beings are not optimistic, it, you know, what are we doing on this planet? Right. We just you have to be in the face of all the evidence against it. And if you've ever gone through like loss in your family, or whatever, you can just see how the how terrible life can be. That, but how you can kind of emerge from that, and it's it's part of life. And you have to then uh, factor that into your optimism. And so, um, by nature, but also just by experience, I've, I'm an optimist. You know. But that said, I, I've kind of my uh, I'm allied with a field called AI, and then you know machine learning, which where there was you know, there's way too much exuberant, overpromising, <laughs> you know, generation after generation. They just seem to not help themselves. So I really, uh, you know, tend to resist of here's my dream technology. Uh, it's rather here, look, it's just folks, it's just like chemical engineering. That sounds very boring and dull to some of my AI colleagues. They say, why don't you, you know, get all on board with, you know, superhumans and chess playing machines and all that. And I say, no, because I think we'll bring more value to humans overall. And we're in a not safe era, you know, if we make it possible for humans to interact more readily with each other and trust each other and all of that, that to me is the moonshot. Um, that to me is what I'm excited about. And having a robot clean my house or anything, I think it's fun, but it's more like a toy in my mind. It's not a mature science. It's not a, it's, it's not what I think the most mature thing for us to be working on is. 
uh, it, it's a fine thing to do and it'll bring a value of its own. Um, but I think the mature thing to be doing is thinking about uh, systematic ways that technology and humans interact. And that's my moonshot. There you go. It's a good, it's a good way to end because I think that in some sense, I feel the same both in duality and also in my research it was always it was always about interaction about mm. how to uh, hide your stuff but still accomplish a, a mm. goal together so the functionality was front and center while keeping your data or maybe your uh, your rights uh, in check so it very, very much resonates with me you know we want to go forward but i'm not willing to <laughs> let you know everything about me Anyway, this has been nice. fantastic. Uh, thank you very nice. much, Michael. I'll see you at Berkeley. I'll see you in Berkeley. Um...